Our distinguished guest of honor is the founder of the Vanguard Group and president of the Vanguard's Global uh, Financial Markets Research Center. He created Vanguard in 1974 and served as chairman and chief executive officer until 1996, and then as senior chairman until 2000. He entered the investment field immediately following his graduation from Princeton University, magna cum laude in economics in 1951. In 2004, Time Magazine named Mr. Bogle as one of the world's most powerful and influential people, an institutional investor, presented him with his Lifetime Achievement Award in 1999. Fortune designated him as one of the investing industries for giants of the 20th industry. In the same year, he received the Woodrow Wilson Award from Princeton University for Distinguished Achievement in the Nation's Service. In 1997, he was named one of the financial leaders of the 20th century in leadership and financial services. In 1998, Mr. Bogle was presented the Award for Professional Excellence from the Association for Investment Management and Research. And in 1999, he was inducted into the Hall of Fame for the Fixed Income Security Analysis Society. If I listed all his honors and achievements, uh, we'd be out of time. So <laughs> without further ado, dispense with that and ask you to please welcome our very special guest of honor, Mr. Jack Bogle. There we go. Well, that says it all. <laughs> <laughs> it's so nice to be with all of you. Uh, and uh, I'm so honored by your trust in me and your confidence in me and, of course, in Vanguard, too. And uh, just a terrific pleasure to be able to come and talk to all of you today. Uh, I uh, am a little embarrassed about all those awards. It does occur to me I haven't gotten any recently. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll hang on <laughs> and, uh, and press on regardless, I guess. Uh, you will all be familiar with that phrase. And uh, I'll probably take up pretty much the hour. I don't know how to time this. Uh, we were busy putting it all together. But I'm sure that uh, we'll use a lot of time. And I presume that's what you want, so we'll do our best. Um, you all honor me by your presence here this morning. And uh, yet another gathering of the Bogleheads is, is uh, obviously I'm glad to be here with my 16th anniversary of a heart transplant coming up in February. Honestly, I'd be glad to be anywhere this morning. <laughs> to say my longtime sidekick, so, so well known to many of you. Uh, Kevin Laughlin is here this morning. And are you back there, Kev, somewhere? Fabulous um, <laughs> work and is, is, has moved in June into the Vanguard kind of mainstream. Uh, the knowledge of a career path with our four people at the Bogle National Markets Research Center. And uh, I don't think I'm going to be replaced when I go. <laughs> <laughs> Center is actually, uh, it, it, we, we, we supported Kevin to his ticket here, so he's done gratis, like Mike Nolan, who, who's here with me this morning at the head table, who's his, Kevin's replacement. And uh, Mike's doing a wonderful job. He started around June, and June 1st, and uh, so a very short learning curve uh, has already become an especially important part of our uh, tiny research unit, along with Emily Snyder. I don't know, is Emily here now? Now she'll be here. Many of you know her. My, my longtime assistant, 25 years, and Sarah Hoffman, who works with Emily, and that's the Global Financial Markets Research Center. Uh, it's, in a way, encouraging uh, to uh, see all the new faces out in the audience this morning. I understand there are 60 of you or so that are here for the first time, and uh, I guess I'm a little disappointed that 60 people there for apparently didn't want to come back again. <laughs> <laughs> I do salute you for your courage. <laughs> and a special welcome for Mel and uh, also Tim Dempsey, who I think have been in all nine previous Global Head gatherings. And I'm closely followed by Gail Cox, who has done eight, and I've already seen Gail this morning. And uh, we have a number of Global Heads who are on your program, as you know. Uh, Ed Tower already spoke this morning, and I didn't get a chance to get briefed on what he said. So what I said flies in the face of anything you're doing. Well, We'll work that out between the two sessions. And uh, 
you're going to hear from Bill Schultz, Schultz Eyes, long term, long time friends of Bill Bernstein, uh, Rick Ferry, who just wrote a wonderful article for Forbes Online, he's up being interviewed with uh, Christine Benz from Morningstar, which is something I just completed, and Laura Dogu, and Alan Roth is here, and Mel Lindauer, I think they're all here. Uh, and also, I think he's here, if you raise your hand, you will have his first visit is uh, my friend Eric Schoenberg, who's the former editor of Money. Is Eric here? Well, the heck with it. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll not only be, be, be seeing you on the podium here, we're going to do a, a little break and then a Q&A. Uh, and if, we, if, if this ends prematurely, I don't mean anything ominous by that. <laughs> we'll, uh, we can start the Q&A before uh, it's over and at the end, before we have a break. And then I'll be with you at lunch. Uh, I, I brought some books that uh, we're just going to give away. I'll let, let, let them know or somebody work out who's going to get them. I'd love 10 copies of Don't Count On It and 15 copies of the uh, paperback edition of Enough, which has an order by Bill Clinton and an introduction by Tom Peters, the management guru. And uh, so we'll be able to, to uh, sign in after lunch. But I'm going to retreat and probably take a nap. And uh, but I'll, I will be with you at Vanguard later on in the afternoon. And, uh, and then, as if, you, <laughs> as if you haven't had enough of me, uh, I'll be with Bill Bernstein in the traditional fireside chat. And tomorrow morning, I always look forward to working with Bill. And he and I have many, many ideas that are similar, if not identical. And a few, which might be interesting to talk about, a few differences along the way. Uh, so here we are, and it's hard to believe that it's 61 years, um, I'm sorry, 51 years, since my first heart attack in 1960. Uh, and uh, on a tennis court at Marion Trade Club, I did win. <laughs> <laughs> and, and coming up, of course, uh, the anniversary of my my heart transplant. I had kind of a hard summer, as some of you know from Jason's wife's interview, and stupidly uh, broke four ribs and ripped my left side hit the toe. Uh, but you know, time heals all wounds, and finally you, you get over it. That's, that's about that. Uh, I, I do notice at this stage of my life that uh, I kind of divided into, into two phases. Uh, one, much more frequent times when my energy is summoning me, mm -hmm. and the much less frequent times when I have to summon my energy. And uh, I had to do that before my heart transplant. I had to summon my energy after and my, my tumble. And, uh, but it's all back now, and now my, my energy is summoning me to be with you this morning. It's been a very busy year for me. I have another book came out just after our last meeting, or at the same time, actually, of our meeting a year ago. Don't count on it. I brought those couple of books here to be uh, signed, or whatever you'd like this afternoon. I've done a bunch of op-eds, as many of you know, for the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, the Financial Times, and they periodically ask me for one, I just send it in, sometimes I do. And uh, I expect to do even more of that in 2012. I've also been very busy on the interview scene, as some of you know, with the television demands seem almost insatiable. I think I've done six or eight of them in the last two or three weeks. Uh, and uh, especially in this age of market turbulence, I do observe, for whatever it's worth, that uh, they call me much more often in down markets than up markets. <laughs> I don't know what to say about that. It's so um, all of this stuff is on my e-blog at johncbogle.com, uh, I guess www.johncbogle.com, and uh, it doesn't get a lot of traffic, I don't think, uh, but in any minute it's all aware, and anything you want to see that you missed is right there, and Michael's doing a terrific job of, of keeping that posted and current. Uh, you probably wonder why it's called an e-blog, not a blog. It's because e-blog is an anagram for Bogle. Think about it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and also during this, this year, I celebrated my uh, 60th year at Vanguard on July 5th, 2011. So that, that uh, anniversary gives me kind of a nice segue into Vanguard today, uh, which is the first part of this talk. Uh, 
And on that date, this, this last summer, I wrote a two-page memo to our veteran crew members who were 15 years or more, and about 2,000 strong, about 1,000 strong, and our Vanguard principals, which we now have 220 of them. So I send my stuff out to them when it seems worth doing uh, in, a, in, a, in a memo entitled, After 60 Years of Past Service, Looking into the Future, and that's also on my blog. And rather than dwelling on the past, however, there's not really much point to that. I wanted to look ahead to Vanguard's 100th anniversary, which will take place on December 28, 2028. That will be the 100th anniversary of our first fund, the Wellington Fund. And in this memo to the, to the crew, uh, I attached excerpts from a speech I gave way back in 1992, which was entitled Vanguard, the First 100 Years. Uh, prematurely, of course, and, then, and I also attached, predicting that we'd still be around 100 years from now, very few corporations are, uh, but one of them happened to be uh, IBM, and they, had, in uh, June, published a, a nice pamphlet, two or three pages in the Wall Street Journal, entitled IBM at 100, published on their 100th anniversary, describing the huge change in the world we live in, and for IBM, it was founded by Thomas J. Watson, way back in 1911, uh, closing with a conviction, quote, that a company can and must change everything about itself, uh, everything about it except itself, uh, about it, it, about itself, except its beliefs. And the final words in the IBM piece are ever onward. And so it is with Vanguard, as we look ahead to that, except that I end my memo with not ever onward, but course, press on regardless. And as I look at Vanguard today, uh, those founding beliefs are pretty much intact. Simple investment strategies that apply the core of our mission and the basic human values of fairness to our client owners, that's you representing them all here today, and respect for one another who serve our crew. All our exponential growth is terrible pressure on your ability to work in a nice human way. I have a statement that I made many, many years ago when I was running a place uh, that we have an awful lot of crew members seem to have posted on their little cubicles, which is, for God's sake, let's always keep Vanguard a place where judgment has at least a fighting chance to triumph over the process. <laughs> and, uh, it's very difficult to do when you, when you uh, get big. Everybody knows that. So we fight against it, and I fight against it wherever I can. Actually, spend an hour with each award for excellence winners. It's probably six or eight every quarter or ten, and uh, so I try and stay in touch and do what I can in my small way to keep Vanguard. Same human values that I've always liked, enjoyed, and held high. Uh, it's not to say that I agree. And we'll talk a little bit about this morning with all of Vanguard's policies and operating decisions. And uh, I couldn't possibly agree with everything, but I try and speak out and do and act. <laughs> I don't get much complaint about it all, at least to my face. Um, <laughs> but I do understand, as I think everybody explains, that our management team has to make tough choices, taking into account not only probabilities, but consequences. Um, and I'm free of those responsibilities. I don't have to worry about it. Um, so it's probably a good thing that I am. And we have a fine management team, some of you will hear from this afternoon, many of whom I know quite well, and I'm pretty sure uh, you will be impressed. So let's then go through a look at Vanguard today by going to our first slide. Yours for again. Actually, yep. There we are. Um, our assets have grown enormously, 500 times over uh, since 1980. Uh, since Actually, it's more than that. It's a thousand times over if you go back to 1974. When we started with 1.4 billion of assets and now are 1.6 trillion. Expenses also have soared up to 350 times. But the point is that uh, two points in this chart. One, uh, if you're growing extremely rapidly, you can afford to spend an awful lot of money and still make sure that the growth of expenses, uh, which are up 350 times, I think I said that, is less than the growth in assets. And hence, our expense ratio has come down way, way, way down and continues to devil our competitors. Um, the, uh, you can see the 
number of crew members there on the chart per billion of assets, and uh, we've done a great job on that. In fact, our 12,000 crew members today are almost the exact same number we had when Vanguard hit 800 billion, um, I guess, uh, in about 2002 or three. So um, that's a little, that's been a great job that we've done. Partly economies of scale, which are natural, but partly really good job, Paul Heller, Morgan, Bob, and Stefano, uh, on uh, technology, using technology. A lot of it's pretty impersonal, but that's the way it has to be done today. And I think people are getting more and more used to it. Uh, the uh, tyranny of compounding, I've talked a lot about. And if you want to go to the next chart, Michael, uh, how big will Vanguard be in the future? And we grew in the early years, which is 25 years, 25% uh, a year, a remarkable growth rate, obviously never continue. In the last 11 years, we've grown a 10% growth rate, and even if we grow at, say, a 7% rate, by 2025, it'll be $4.1 trillion. And 7% is probably not unreasonable, providing we don't have the apocalypse or something like that, because these, these funds will have, of course, an internal rate of return, and diminish though it may be from the past. So we're gonna get very big, and, uh, you know, I tried when I was here, and, uh, you know, the speech that I gave all those years ago was called uh, the tyranny of compounding. Just be very conscious of how numbers grow as you grow in size and at any kind of a reasonable growth rate. And uh, so I always was in favor of organic growth, letting our record and service speak for themselves and not forcing growth. So as you can imagine, I'm a little bit skeptical about money spent on vanguarding. And <laughs> uh, with the one caveat that uh, it's one slogan that I, or one turn of the English language that Merrill Lynch cannot use. <laughs> so I'm still a small but beautiful guy. Small but beautiful guy. And, but nice that in the face of this enormous growth we picked at the very beginning, and I'll talk much more about this later on, an investment strategy that is basically scalable, indexing, and does not have the problems of size that, for example, a firm like Capital Group has. You can't run a trillion and a half dollars on an active management basis and expect to get any more significant. So the problem is, uh, on the human side of the business, and I think everybody at Vanguard is trying to deal with it, to the extent we can make it still a personal place where everybody feels respected, and so much the better. Um, so growth, there it is, here it comes, and measured, I guess, mostly by our share of industry assets. Um, and you can see it just goes up and up and up, and, and uh, I don't know what's gonna stop it. Uh, so I've observed in a couple of places, this, these are uh, long-term funds. No, these are full funds. Um, and uh, county money market, uh, our long-term share is up around 16 or 17 percent, and no one in this business ever has had a market share that low. So they usually top out around 12 to 13. Um, but uh, even as that share grows, I have to confess that I don't take anything for granted. I still love a good fight, and uh, so I'm particularly amused by this next comparison. I want to throw that up, my <laughs> these, these are long-term assets, that's 16.2 percent, uh, from 5.2, or actually up from 4, while Fidelity is just going down and down, and they've lost market share year after year after year, and I wonder what they're thinking. You know, we had a director at Fidelity who was a good friend of a Vanguard director, and I was known as God in their boardroom. And not as a compliment, by the way. <laughs> it was like Ed Johnson saying, what do you suppose God's going to do about this? <laughs> I don't know. But, uh, you know, it, it's an interesting competition, or was, uh, between Fidelity and, and us, because for them it's kind of war and, and bad feelings. For, with me it's a, you know, kind of a happy competition in which whoever offers the best products at the lowest prices and the best service is going to win. And I think that's what we're seeing on this chart. And uh, you can see their turn, if you look carefully, came right at the, right at the time that the bubble in the stock market burst, the end of 1999 was their peak. And it's down 40%. That's a big loss of market share, 40% decline to 9% today. 
And it's only a matter of time until we'll be twice as big as they are in market share. It's amazing. And uh, this is the, these are long-term assets. You can see they're much bigger than we are in the money market. Fund field, which has been field is very quiet at the moment. And when you take that into account, and uh, we're only, if that's the right word to use, uh, $375 billion ahead of them. So it's fun, and I like a good fight. Uh, but it's not just fidelity, it's, you know, it's, China. it's um, the, uh, we're wearing the crown right now, the largest firm in the industry. As I mentioned, we're at an all-time high in market share. And, and when you take it compared to the landscape, competitive landscape, when Vanguard began, we didn't do 74, it was easier to find the 1980 data. And uh, we'll do 74 shortly. And when we have time, and you can see uh, what's happened to those market shares of the leaders in those days. And uh, you can see that just about everybody has lost, in some cases, a lot. Uh, you can see Putnam going from 4.2 to 0.6. That's, as you tell me, 80% loss in market share. And uh, they earned every penny of it. <laughs> <laughs> and capital group just slowed down, way down. It's afraid it grows. It's actually shrinking at the moment. It's the only, the only significant one. It's the only, the only one that went up in market share uh, compared to any right. So um, the competitive landscape is saying, I think, uh, that um, indexing is popular, that the demands in the marketplace, that uh, our balance between bond funds and stock funds is much more oriented toward bonds than most people in the industry. That's been a big help in the last decade. Uh, our performance has been good. We'll talk a little bit about that. Um, people trust Vanguard, and I see this in my correspondence that I get literally every day. And uh, so uh, it's hard to see at the moment uh, how that growth is going to be interrupted and where the real competition is coming from. Uh, you know, there's a lot of, there are a few big firms in this list, C. Putnam, Capital, um, Merrill Lynch, BlackRock, that's a merger, uh, and uh, the rest of them, and, and Fidelity, of course. And then you go way down, I mean, the next, next firm is probably really 3% or so of the industry assets, way down. Leaders, and that has some implications that I hope everybody at Vanguard is thinking about. And uh, we've also become much more attractive to large investors, if you want to flip up that chart. And way back in 1992, I had this idea that we should let the competitors know there was no point in their cutting costs because we'd cut them further. And uh, so they're just going to lose. And so we, we did what we call selective scale prices. That's what I called it then, back in 1992, and started our first Admiral Funds, which meant it could larger amounts of money, you got a lower expense ratio. Uh, simply simply respecting, and it's not a brilliant decision, but to simply reflecting the reality of pricing in this business. And that is a hundred thousand dollar <laughs> account, and probably has the same cost to us, maybe even a lower cost to us, uh, a two thousand dollar account. And then yet they were both paying pretty much the same expense ratio. So we decided to do what was proper, encourage the larger investors who were important to our being able to reduce overall expense ratios everybody. So uh, this was a, uh, at that uh, kind of low cost, attracting 40, was it, 31% of our assets now in our admiral shares is, I think, uh, speaks for itself. But uh, unfortunately, the press doesn't seem to get it right. They think we're cutting costs for the admiral shares. But really, we're not cutting costs. We operate costs. So when you reduce the cost on a certain group of funds, you're raising them maybe maybe immeasurably on someone else. It's not a big gap. It doesn't change our revenues one penny over the other way we speak. So it looks pretty good. Vanguard growing and doing I think, pretty much the right things. The key to our growth, I'm going to go to the next one, is of course index funds and uh, the driving force. Uh, yes, we did start the first index mutual fund. There was a little controversy about this, but you all, some of their number both Bogle posts on this point. But there were a couple letters in the Wall Street Journal implying that somehow I didn't really start the first index fund. Well, if there's anything that is clear in all this, it's the, that is the first index fund, period, the first index mutual fund. No one argues with that. They say other people had the ideas. Even I had some back in my senior thesis in 1951 talking about beating how hard it was to beat the index. And uh, one thing I want to mention to you, because you get to a point in this life where all you have is your credibility 
And I thought some of those letters suggested I wasn't telling the whole truth about the other people that worked on this issue. And the fact is, I've been telling the truth about it, the whole truth and nothing about the truth, since about 1995 or 6, when indexing started to get popular, giving full credit to Jeremy Grantham, who tried to do indexing and, and failed back in 1971, uh, and for his trouble was awarded by Pensions and Investment Magazine, uh, the worst idea in years. That's how Pension and Investment described Jeremy's foray. And I talked about guys I know personally, like Bill Faust and Mac McBone out of Wells Fargo. They were pioneers in this area in a very sophisticated way. I don't do it in a sophisticated way. Uh, and other people that have come along the road. And uh, so we did start the first index fund. And uh, it's, as I've often reminded our uh, crew in another context, totally relevant here, sure, the ideas are out there. But what I've said is ideas are a dime a dozen, but implementation is everything. And we think about that for a minute. Impl implementation is everything. So we did it. I'm not sure the landscape would be much different if we, ha if we hadn't been first, if we'd been second or third or fourth. But the fact of the matter is, my recollection now, we started the fund, I know we started the fund in 1975, and I think the first, the second index mutual fund was started by, I believe, Wells Fargo in 1982. That's a, a great idea when nobody copies it for six, for six years. So uh, and I, I wrote to the journal editors did my piece with me, which was cut markedly. Uh, like uh, I, I compared it, I, I sent it actually to the journal editor. So I'll just tell you this little anecdote because I wanted some observation of our 30th anniversary. That was appropriate, and I, I got going a little bit late. I just had the idea one afternoon of writing this piece, and I wrote it and got it off to him. At that time it was, I think maybe seven, uh, July, August 28th or something. And uh, the date is August 31st when the, other, when the underwriting took place. And uh, so I sent him this piece, the guys I know on the op-ed page, I don't know well. And I said, I want this to go into the review. It's too long for you guys. So they looked at it and said, well, why don't you give it to us first? So I sent it to them. It was 2,000 words. And uh, I knew that they just don't do 2,000 words op-eds. So they said, if you can get it to 1,400 words, um, we think we can use it. So ever the sucker. Um, I cut it to 1,400 words, and I said to somebody, you know, doing that cutting reminded me of James Franco in 127 hours, cutting off his arm. And that's what editing my own commentary is. And, uh, and they come back with some more edits, we're now down to 1,000 words. So it missed a lot, but it kept a lot, it kept the sense of it. And, you know, I had the option of saying, nope, that's too much, you're out. But, you know, you get to that point, you say, publish it the way it is. So it wasn't as complete as I like it, but I have the complete one on my website, too. So for whatever that's worth. But I am sensitive to anyone saying anything except, yes, he did start the first index fund. And no, he wasn't the first one to have the idea. I freely concede that. Unless 1952 was 51 was the first chance of that. So uh, it's uh, our strategies go far beyond the index fund. And that's what I'm going to talk mostly about here after talk about index funds, uh, going to what I call virtual index funds. And that's a description that people in particular in our bond department do not like. Uh, but uh, that, the whole idea of some of the funds we consider active is, is to have them as much like an index as we can possibly make them when there isn't a suitable index around. So indexing share of equity fund assets has versioned, um, giving rise to this great paradox. The title of a speech I gave five or six or eight years ago, I can't remember. The conversion is a great paradox. Even as active management, reflected in higher R squares, gets more and more like indexing, so indexing gets more and more like active management. And so I'm a kind of, what have they done to my song, Mom? <laughs> Tied up in a plastic bag and turned it upside down. And much of the growth of indexing, you can see it there, coming from exchange traded funds. Um, but indexing, whilst 25%, 24% of, of equity fund assets, uh, if you go back five years to think of the real importance of indexing and how it's taken over, uh, cash flows in index funds, index mutual funds in the last five years were $630 million, and cash flow into actively managed equity funds was $7.6 million. That's 630 to 7 or 7.5. That's a big difference. 
and that impact is going to continue and indexing is going to be more important and people kind of don't recognize it, but they're starting to recognize it more almost every day. You see it in the financial analyst journals, you see it in the economist newspaper, you see it in the button with column there. Uh, it's become an accepted thing, you don't really have to explain it anymore. Uh, but beyond that, uh, indexing, uh, our great strategy from the beginning, and I know, struggled for years and years to find the right words to describe it, but I described it at the beginning as having funds that have relative predictability. There must relative predictability to their categories. And uh, the idea is you can reduce behavioral problems of investors jumping on the hottest of the latest bandwagon. Right? If you kind of tie anchor your funds to a certain standard and have a high relative predictability. So not pure indexing, but virtual indexing which has high correlation with a target, uh, which has low turnover, low cost, of course, uh, very low cost, and specific uh, maturity standards in the case of our bond funds. And it's also true, I'll talk a little bit about this later on, um, it's also true of our multi-manager strategy. I've always liked the multi-manager strategy. Not because we can pick great managers, because we can, and I couldn't, I'm not casting any aspersions on it, and I think I batted 510, which I will say is probably better than Ted Williams 406, <laughs> <laughs> but not not very good. And I don't know if we're batting 510 or 490 now, uh, but conceptually it's going to be if you pick five managers of fund, they're going to end up being pretty much average. So when you go over to uh, our market share, we totally dominate the index fund market. <laughs> you pick that next one, um, and uh, relatively small factor so far in ETFs. Uh, and uh, uh, that's a 14% active fund share for the industry. Now I want to talk a little bit about this idea of correlations, relative predictability, uh, so we can put this next chart up, like what you would, uh, and show you here the correlation of our, uh, over on the far right, uh, the correlations of our funds in each category um, with their targets. With the index funds, the correlation is 93, uh, you look at virtual index funds, I mean, the, the index funds are 99, I'm surprised not 100. Uh, balanced funds are 100, the in index, meaning we match the index uh, very closely. Uh, and the virtual index funds are very high, 93. For the bond funds usually explained by, those are our municipals mostly, uh, usually explained by small differences in maturity in our strategy compared to the industry. Uh, balanced funds, the Wellington fund is way up there with a 90. Eight, I think, or 96 correlation. And on average, uh, balance funds are 99, and the actives, even even so, with multi-manager, uh, particularly in balance and equity, uh, are 92 car percent correlations. And the idea is that uh, don't have something that gets hot, like where Mr. Berkowitz is down 30 percent this year uh, on fair home fund last year's hero. It happens all the time. I was talking to Christine Benz, the Morning Star lady, a little while ago, and, and uh, I said, you know, you probably ought to stop picking managers of the year. Because every one of them turns out, ultimately, every one of them turns out to be, uh, a phrase I've often used, you think they're stars, but they turn out to be comets. <laughs> lighting, up, lighting up the firmament for a moment in time, and then burning out their ashes, drifting gently down. <laughs> Uh, 93, and uh, so you'll see 
those individual clients are, are very, very tightly tied to their, their targets and their best fit indexes. And they win because of that column all the way over on the right, low expenses. This is not complicated. And it looks little on a year-to-year -year basis. These are annual expense ratios. When they compound over the years, there's all the difference in the world. So we see that uh, growing and uh, see an active, a, a growing part of portion of Vanguard's assets going to the next one. I'm not again, you'll see what I call virtual. And again, they don't like that term in the office. They think they're active managers in terms of the muni bonds, which is sort of an issue here. They are, in their own way, active managers. We have very definite maturity standards, very definite quality standards, and they're not to be violated, and they don't change all the time. So in any event, uh, active uh, share is very, very high. It is, is, is dwindling half what it was in 1990, roughly half, and the virtual share is <laughs> up to about 82%. These aren't hard numbers or anything like that, uh, but just to give you an idea of the direction in which we're going. So the idea is not to disappoint, uh, or as the subtitle of my 2005 book said, uh, the only way to guarantee your fair share of stock market returns, and it is. So uh, in all this, uh, the equity funds are kind of a wild card. And uh, I'll show that next one. Can we do this here? Yeah, I guess we can do that here. You can see how important cost is to this whole equation. Um, it's not the ability to pick great managers. Not me either, as I said. But it's about keeping costs in. And you'll see things from Vanguard that give you those blue bars there, the extent to which our 10-year performance uh, outpaces those of our competitors. And you can see we're 100% in the bond area, 100% uh, in the money market area, almost 90% in the balanced area, 61% in the stock area, meaning we outperform most of our competitors a little lower than usual. But the reality is we're there because we have no low cost. So if you look at Stock funds were below average manager picker. X cost, uh, just a little bit above average in, in bonds, which I don't think is a material thing one way or the other. Below average would just mean we had higher quality. Um, uh, in balance funds, money market funds, balance funds maintain pretty well, and money market funds, of course, drop radically. And uh, that, that drop in the money market is simply because we've stayed with higher quality, and I never regret that. This is not a definitive chart, this is a directional chart. So um, it's just the reality, the reality check. So it's not a good idea to brag about our ability to pick great managers, because when you see the 61% or the 100% or the 89%, you're ignoring the fact that most of our advantage is, is in cost. We had a guy that worked in our municipal department, a senior person, Jerry Jacobs, who had a superb record. He ran the intermediate term municipal bond fund. He was hired away for many millions of dollars a year by Putnam. And all of a sudden, this top manager became a bottom manager. Did he lose all his intelligence? No. He went to work for a municipal bond fund that charged one and a quarter percent instead of two tenths of one percent. And there went his record. I don't know why Putnam didn't examine it this way. They might have done a little bit better. They had a lot of problems there. But in any event, it's a very uh, growing impact on its cost and it affects everything we do. Uh, I now want to turn to ETFs as such. I mentioned them before. I'll give you a little presentation here. Uh, I mentioned what have they done to my song. This is the antithesis of my idea of buying and holding forever. It's in that when we look back on the history of exchange traded funds, it's going to be probably the greatest marketing strategy of the first decade. 21st century. Has it been the greatest investment strategy? Absolutely not. How can we have a great marketing strategy that hurts investors? Well, they will figure it out. Okay. There's nothing the matter, to be clear, about buying an ETF and holding it forever. Now, you will do just as well and if you do the total stock market, Vanguard total stock market, if you buy the ETF and hold it as, as uh, if you buy the regular fund. I always thought when I came into this business, my God, you can get your money back on any given day? This was 1951. I thought that was a miracle. And uh, now it's in any given second. And uh, 
it does hold out the temptation to trade and is used to trade. So we see ETS now coming in for you know, a certain amount of attention. Um, New York Times had a headline the other day, volatility, thy name is ETF, signing to ETFs, particularly these triple double reverse lattes. <laughs> or whatever they are. I can hear people ordering those things. I don't know what they are. Uh, but uh, all, all fancied up. And double leverage wasn't enough, so now it's triple leverage. And going up was not enough. You know, I now got to get it going down. And uh, the money question had played a big role in the flash crash a couple of years ago. Uh, it is playing a big role in these wild gyrations we get at the closing hours in the market, closing hour in the marketplace. And uh, doesn't seem to be part of the high frequency trading syndrome, uh, but that's another cause of all this volatility. Uh, ETS have also been at the center of a number of frauds and market manipulations, including that two billion loss taken by United UBS of Switzerland, including a Goldman Sachs partner who was doing something illicit, which I can't remember, and I'm sure a lot more is done in the ETF area. Uh, I was struck the other day, I'll put this one up for a sec. My wife and I were out shopping or something on a Saturday morning. I looked at the license plate on a car, on the car in front of me, and here's what it says. Oh, gee. <laughs> <laughs> she said, Eve said, what does that mean? <laughs> I said, oh my god, my idea. It's highest one. Index trader. And of course the guy was driving a Jaguar. <laughs> Maybe that's, that's the world we have. Uh, and uh, Vanguard has become a very strong entrant in the ETF market. I think in the, in the better way, as far as I can tell in the better way, while our market share is, is uh, creeping up at uh, 12%, we actually did 33%, so you put that, uh, that uh, creeping up from uh, 4% to 12% and triple in a year is uh, pretty good. In five years is pretty good. Or I'm sorry, in five years. Five, yeah, it's five years. Um, and uh, the uh, we're actually now doing 33% of all the cash flow in the ETS. So that's going to grow and grow. And I just hope, and I have no way of knowing this, that, and you'll, you'll see the, that they'll be over there this afternoon, the guys that run our ETF business. Um, well, I don't have to know. Um, and uh, induce myself to one we hope to do this afternoon. But, um, I hope that will be nice. <laughs> but I think deep down there, honestly, isn't a, isn't a big difference between the management's view and mine. Uh, implementation, again, may be different. But nobody at Vanguard thinks trading ETS for this kind of rapidity is a good idea. You just can't believe that. And so we try and avoid that. Yet there's a lot of volatility in what we do and what everybody else does. You can see this turnover is unbelievable. If you want to go to the next chart. The pro shares and uh, ultra S P <laughs> turns over at seventeen thousand six hundred and sixty nine percent a year, an average holding period of two point one days. The spiders typically run around ten thousand percent a year. And uh, ultra short now that's popular. And take a guess at what the market's going to do. And magnify it by three, ten thousand percent a year. And then the more speculative indexes, spiders, the uh, Qs, um, other ones that are hot periodically. Uh, China, look at Brazil, 2,946 holding period, 12 days. Uh, I shares emerging markets, 2,500. Spider gold shares, 1,500. IFA index, more conservative than most, but still a thousand percent a year. Uh, 36 day holding period. Now, Vanguard is obviously doing better than that, but probably not a better suit me. I think we're doing it right. Uh, for example, our Emerging markets index turns over at about 750% a year, and that's the quarter, or whatever one wants to say, of what the, I, the uh, MSCI is. 757%, still an awful lot of turnover. Our total stock market is better, but while we uh, at 300% a year, that's better. You know, I'm a guy that believes 20% turnover is pushing the envelope. <laughs> so, so I look at these things and I think, what the hell? Hey, what, what the heck is going on? <laughs> but it raises uh, the issue of is all this turnover good for investors? And the number of Boglehead posts on this comment, you've probably seen many of them, 
uh, saying that the idea that I have, they don't, they don't put it in these posts that I recall, uh, that we ought to be examining investor returns, returns those investors are making uh, in these various ETF categories compared to the returns the fund makes. To take an easy one, uh, the, the large cap uh, ETF investment funds uh, have produced, obviously not a very good return, over the last 10 years of 1.7% a year, but the average investor, uh, I'm sorry, of 3.2% a year, but the average investor in those funds has earned 1.7%. So that's a cumulative loss over a decade, 18% of your capital, just by all that trading. In mid and small cap, the gap is 48% over a decade, half of your money lost uh, to, the, to the index standard. Uh, international developed markets, these are um, what, you, what you know about, we'll talk more about that later. 91% uh, of the capital gets lost, and in individual countries, it's 223.2. We didn't have emerging markets, uh, individual countries, uh, the, the international developed is the whole market, and then we go to individual countries. So people are betting on things like Brazil or Nepal or wherever else they are. And uh, you can see that a 10% return is enormously different from compounding. 4% and the investor grows to 56%, a very nice return, I admit. But at 14%, its fund earns uh, in its regular time weighted dollar, unit you know, weighted, if you will, return as 280%. So it's a huge gap. We don't have these inverse and leveraged equity funds uh, for 10 years, so we used to look at five years and you couldn't put them in the above chart. And you can see they're not starting off so very well. Uh, emerging markets lost 20% uh, of your capital. Inverse equity, 7%. And, but look, look at how good the people were picking the inverse times. Uh, if you stayed in that fund for, for uh, five years, you lost 56% of your capital. I'm, yeah, you lost just 56 compared to only, if only is the right word, 49% for the return by the fund in that period of that leverage. So you, you just see this, and it's uh, time weighted returns are a little controversial. Uh, I mean, sorry, investor returns, dollar weighted returns are somewhat controversial. And I first started talking about them in 19, why we should have funds report them in uh, way back in 19. 96, one of my first speeches after getting out of the hospital, and uh, everybody thought it was the dumbest idea they've ever heard because everybody knows what the fact is. And that is, if you want to look at the return, the fund says, Here's what we earn. You know, in almost every case, the investor earned less, a little less, or a lot less, but less. And uh, when you look at standard mutual funds, not ETFs, the gaps are there, but much, much smaller. So uh, it's part of the business, but we shouldn't, I don't think we should be in the business of taking advantage of people's uh, shortcomings and behavioral problems. Uh, so, I mean, you commented, and that's an interesting subject, but one of, the, one of the reforms I would like to see is that all mutual funds, ETFs and otherwise, actually be required to report the returns their investors earn, and not just the re returns the funds earn. It's well within our technological capability. And when you see these gaps shown in the next chart, which is so dramatic, which is what I do is take the right-hand section of the other chart, and, uh, Grabbed it, made it, made it grab it. And it's really quite startling. These, some of these are all startling. And so the ETFs are getting more and more extreme. It's good marketing. Uh, and uh, so it's very disruptive to the markets, particularly these, these inverse equities, leverage equities. And we shall see, but I don't like what I see so far. In addition to these specialty areas, ETFs have become the, become the vehicle where if you've got some amazing new investment idea, you go the ETF route rather than the, than the regular fund route because the, the idea of ETFs is a hot marketing idea. And uh, so you never probably hear of people like Rafi 100, Rob Arnott's thing, uh, or Jeremy Siegel's Wisdom Total Dividend thing if they just did it in the conventional way. So they do the ETFs and they have the answers. These uh, fundamental index, and it's cool if you want to go to that. And, uh, you can see that the, the, Jeremy Siegel was quoted as saying, this is the, the we're the Copernicans, 
of the new age. We revise the rules of the, of the heavens, and it's all going to be different now. And it's not. I mean, you can see in the, the blue, that's Arnott's thing. It's much more volatile and produces a return, you know, a point, a point different from, from the uh, and, and Vanguard total stock market. Not much difference, and that's a very short period. I'm confident that the differences will just uh, exist in a very small level and maybe a losing level in the long run because of these funds' costs, not just their expense ratios, which are high by my standards, but because of the turnover it takes to do that. And curiously enough, I, I, I like the Jeremy Siegel's Wisdom Tree fund based on index, the total amount of dividends paid. So, big dividend payer would be larger on the list. And, uh, if that was a, basically a total bomb, and that total dividend fund is now 1% uh, uh, Wisdom Tree's total assets. That's what it did. 1% about 170 million out of 13 billion. And uh, they've got more things for trading currencies. I have a list of them here, but I won't take your time to read it. But you look like you're you know, reading a lunatic's map of the world. Who <laughs> 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 wants to buy or sell Indian rupees? Not me. Uh, but it's a stretch. But in any event, if you took out of that chart over there, the fact that the uh, Arnaud Rappi is significantly more volatile than that, uh, like 15% more volatile than Vanguard's whole stock market, it really accounts for the entire difference. So it's much ballyhooed. Uh, he's the greatest salesman since P.T. Barnum, I think. And uh, he, he still believes it's working, but you know, I'm not looking at this record. So there we are, uh, an industry headed off in the wrong direction, in my opinion, uh, and uh, that's a big growth part of the industry. It has to taper off, and investors have to get wise about the fact there's no trading, there's no money in trading rapidly in the stock markets. And eventually, of course, like the gamblers of Las Vegas, they will not have no money left. And uh, so uh, that will be the end of the ETF. I'm saying that a little hyperbolically, but it just, Used properly in the right kind of funds, held for the long term, uh, very diversified funds, bond, stock, developed markets, maybe even emerging markets. It's, and we'll talk about that later. Uh, it's uh, okay. But if, if that accounts for 5% of the use of ETFs, I'd be absolutely amazed. And no one knows how to, clock, how to count that. So let me talk now about uh, first books and uh, and then some closing reflections on my life and times. And uh, I have copies of, I think I brought about 10 copies of, don't count on it. If you flew here, don't, don't buy one. Don't come I mean, I'm giving them away, so now you'll have to figure out how to get rid of them. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd be glad to sign as I said this afternoon. I've had 15 copies of paperback enough, which is fine for the airplane travelers. Uh, and uh, I'll sign them after lunch. So I just thought it might be interesting to reflect on the books, which, uh, you know, I don't know. I keep thinking, you know, is, there must be something terribly the matter with me. Because I don't know anybody else in the industry except for Peter Lynch who has written one book or two. And there may be other people, but I, I don't know them. Someone correct me if I'm wrong. So I'm wondering, um, is an old expression, everybody is out of step but me. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe it's stupid. And then anyway, they now go back to 1993, which tragically, tragically, uh, was the best seller of the whole bunch. <laughs> and uh, going downhill from there. <laughs> but, but they all do pretty well. And in particular, a um, little book of common sense investing is a small book. Uh, the only way to guarantee your fair share of stock market returns. Continues to do extremely well, and it's, it, even though it's now uh, four years old. And, and you know, we go by sales, we go by Amazon things, we go by comments. They get great comments on Amazon, mostly, like four and a half stars. There's always somebody that doesn't, and doesn't like your books on Amazon. It's very humbling <laughs> to read that. <laughs> and my favorite comment was, this author has a real problem. He likes, he writes more like a novelist than an economist. <laughs> <laughs> And I thought, well, that's my problem. I'm feeling pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> and someone wrote about Vogel on mutual funds way back in all those years. I never forget. You never forget the, the nasty comments. You forget the good ones pretty quickly. He said, uh, good analysis 
poor conclusions. Just what you'd expect, <laughs> just what you'd expect from an MBA. <laughs> I was heartened by the fact I didn't have an MBA. <laughs> so, uh, and, and, and even that great big orange tome, so it did pretty well. I can't tell you the numbers, but maybe 25,000 copies or something. A typical business book sells about 5,000. And you know, it's not Michael Lewis territory, that I can assure you. But uh, I'm pretty, I feel pretty good every once in a while look at these things. I feel pretty good about what I've written and the way I've written it. But I think they will stand. If someone wants to look at them and get a picture of this whole group of books on the development of the financial industry and the mutual fund industry in the uh, in its great growth phase at the end of the 20th, through the end of the 20th century and sort of consolidating phase, phase that begins thereafter, um, I think they will get a good picture of what life really was. Not in retrospect, but what I was thinking and saying then. Does anybody really care about that? I have absolutely no idea, but I care about it. And that's good enough for me. Uh, I, I'm working on my, my next book. Uh, and you've seen, I think, the original essay, which was turned into a speech at the Financial Museum of Financial History. The, the, the book is titled the same as the speech, Clash of Cultures, Investment versus Speculation. And I don't know, and I think Emily thought we should have another orange cover. But uh, that's where we are. They left out the V. Uh, but that will be coming out. I had to, I think I mentioned this, I had to postpone a little bit until February 28th. I had such a big setback in my health and my ability to summon my energy for that matter that uh, it just took a little longer. It will take a little longer. I'm not really deeply into it yet, but once I get through this thing today, I'll go back to it pretty much full time for the rest of the year until maybe February, as much as I can. Uh, so I mentioned that first speech, and I just want to give you this one example of how much speculation has taken over to the detriment of our society. Uh, and that is, if you look at investment as, as, we, as we conventionally do, capitalism, uh, capital formation, as directing capital to its highest and best uses, companies that are growing, companies that are providing better products and services at lower and lower prices, that's what investing in is, putting money in those companies. And every year, uh, the American financial system directs about $200 billion into IPOs and into additional uh, how, 200 billion, how, how much is speculation? Well, if you take the share turnover in the markets and multiply it by the price of shares, it is $40 trillion. So that's 200 times, by my measure, of speculation as we do investment. And that's just a big waste for everybody except the croupiers down on Wall Street. They aren't too happy to call the croupiers. <laughs> they don't complain directly anyway. So that's going to be the first chapter. Uh, second one will be very tentative. I'm talking about the happy conspiracy between corporate managers and fund managers in this. And there's been nothing written about this. The problem is faced by what I call a dual agency society. Agents always have problems putting their principal's interests before their own, whether it's money managers or corporations. But now we have agents of agents, and that is to say these corporations are not owned by individuals. That would be the conventional agency problem. But but corporations that are controlled by corporations that represent individuals, and that's institutional investors, and mostly mutual funds, the largest segment of that. And uh, these institutions own 70% of all the stock in America. So this is a tremendous conflict of interest, uh, and all other, many, many other things that arise from this uh, dual agency society. I'm going to try and think of a better term for that. I like the term happy conspiracy. I used the title The Silence of the Funds before. It's taken when Silence of the Lambs was in the news, that was an evil movie. And uh, I, I want to get into the implications of all this uh, trading and all these agency problems into a uh, lack of interest in corporate governance. You've heard about that from me, about our failure to do anything about the same executive compensation, our unwillingness to stand up and be counted on corporate political contributions, one of America's great outrages. I know I'm not supposed to talk politics in LL. I said it, here it is. <laughs> <laughs> Change character of the mutual fund industry uh, in ETF chapter index fund for investment or index fund for speculations. Um, I spent a lot of time talking about fiduciary duty and, in fact, have some work I've done earlier a measurement system that measures fiduciary duty, whether your manager is observing it or not. Uh, our retirement system, the basic fundamental part of America, making sure we don't have everybody on the leaf when they retire, uh, is failing us and uh, have. 
of ideas for fixing that, uh, I have some simple investment advice, uh, and then the chapter I'm really happy with, and I am actually working on this now, is an example of what happens when a fund turns from investment to speculation, and that is what happened in the case of Wellington Fund. And I do that chapter first because we pay more attention to history, and it's all gone. And uh, you know, when I'm gone, I don't know who's even going to know the history that I'm describing that chapter. It's amazing. But, but I've been with Wellington for 60 years of its 80 year, 83 year existence, and uh, you know, I'm kind of the last, last guy that, can, can, that has the knowledge to do it. So I think I have an obligation to do it. I also have an obligation to honor my great mentor, Walter Morgan, who picked me up out of the air and made me into something I probably never would have been otherwise. And uh, so that's a fun chapter, right? With a real message because the, the fall came when we did the merger back in 1967. And in the following 10 years, the fund had the worst record relative to its competitors in its entire history. And you can just see it because we compromised on quality. We had a slightly higher turnover, uh, and we took funds, uh, R squared, or a beta measurement to the market, which well, like it should be about a 65, has been. We took it to 104. We made well into a stock fund. And that was only with a 73 or 4% equity ratio higher than ever. But when stocks are more speculative, you take that, that, that risk right up, and then the ring fell apart. Fund drop is really a great story. <coughs> uh, the fund drop, fund assets dropped from $2 billion to $400 million, and now it's back to $52 or $3 billion, uh, and leading the balanced fund segment of the industry once again. So it's a fun story. It's a story with a real lesson. It's a story which is the very least of what I owe to my great mentor. And then I don't know what I'll do about looking ahead, and I'll think of something by then. <laughs> <laughs> so now, uh, a few reflections on the market, and a few investment principles, or at least reminders of the same. What should I do now? Keep going. markets 2011. Uh, we've had bear markets all over the world, even in the U.S. They, they don't tell us we had a bear market, but some genius once said it was a 20% decline. And while the 500 didn't go, 500 didn't go, be good performer this year. Total stock market index, in fact, was down more than 20%. Uh, developed market index is 25, 26. Emerging dropped 30. And uh, <coughs> total international, uh, combining the two, dropped 27. So, uh, we had a huge recovery, I'll talk about that in a minute. Since then, making very, me very comfortable. When this first big crash came, everybody wanted to know what to do, and I said, you know, my advice is do nothing. Uh, don't just stand, the, the old rule is, uh, don't, don't just stand there, do something. That's what we always do in times of crisis. And I said, don't, just don't do something, just stand there. And, uh, you know, it takes a little, I guess, guts or stupidity. Uh, I have to say that because you never, nobody knows, least of all, what's going to happen on the next days, the weeks, and the months. It turned out to be uh, very good advice throughout, throughout all this. Because right now we're back. I don't know how much upgrade you got. That was the same thing as yesterday. Okay, so you can see we had an enormous recovery. Um, 500 index is not too far from up to the year. Um, emerging markets down about 17 percent. Total international down 12. And then, of course, bonds giving a nice protective element. All I have to say is this, this doesn't fit in the chart at all, at all but I had to say it anyway. And uh, that, uh, interestingly enough, it's been a great year for the bond market index fund. Not because it's great, but it's very heavily weighted toward treasuries, U.S. treasuries and mortgage backed bonds, 70% or something like that. Where that's a, a, you know, you'd say overweighted in treasuries, except that's the market weight. And uh, so that made it very good in 2008, very bad. Nine, uh, okay in 2010, now excellent in 2011. And I just can't resist noting that the genius, and he is a genius, by the way, Bill Gross, uh, I don't mean to take anything away from him, but even the best generals make mistakes. His bet against the treasuries proved to be wrong, so we picked up uh, 500 basis points, a very, very unusual uh, end for the year. Um, now, we have a bear market, uh, 
working on his new role has come back as well as accurate. And uh, I was trying to make the point that sometimes in history, I always like to take a historical perspective, bear markets stop around 20% when you get over there. And at some points, they go continue to go down, and we never know which is which. But here's uh, um, here's what this one looks like. These are, these are all the bear markets in the post-war period. And you can see that you probably can't count them too quickly, but post-World War II, there were 12 such bear markets. I count that 19 as a 20. Three got much worse, and nine didn't. And we had no idea whether this is a pause, an interregnum, or whether it's going to get worse. But I have to say, uh, I'm always com comforted when you know, things start to consolidate and level out. I don't like these bear markets. They make me nervous, not so much nervous, predicting the market, but nervous because at some point at which you have huge behavioral problems when the market does a certain thing, or it redeems their shares and that makes it worse. So uh, we, it's a, I think maybe a slightly hopeful sign, but we shouldn't be looking so much at a chart like this, but rather what rational expectations are for the future. And that brings me to uh, a rule that you've heard from me a long time, and if you read all my stuff, which nobody could. Uh, and that is, the idea is to stay the course if you're on the right course for you. Uh, and that may, may involve being conservative for some and aggressive for others, depending on age and other factors. Uh, but control what you can. You can control time in two senses. Start investing as early as you can, for example. The difference between investing early and late is enormous. And then use long-term managers. Don't use short-term speculative managers. Tax impacts. At risk, you can control. Uh, if the fund controls it, and I, you know, I mentioned Wellington Fund, uh, you, you control the risk of Wellington Fund, but back in the late 60s and early 70s, Wellington Fund didn't control its own risk. So keep an eye on fund betas. And you can, of course, control costs, uh, low cost providers, um, use low cost providers, use low turnover funds, use no other funds. And what you can't control, which is returns, have rational expectations. Let me just give you a quick gander at these rational expectations. You've seen this in my stuff. And this is the way to look at markets. I mean, it's unequivocal that the source of market returns are dividends, earnings growth, and PE change. Any period you want to look at, days, weeks, months, that's all that happens. So this is kind of a rough guess of 2% dividend yield today, maybe 6% or 7% earnings growth, or maybe 5%, uh, but in any event, uh, maybe a slightly lower PE, uh, because PEs, as I mentioned, were I guess I mentioned to Christine, but I don't think too much out of line, a little bit on the high side. Uh, and maybe 7% on stocks, which is doubling your money. And bond returns are 2% on the 10 year Treasury, the benchmark. Uh, but I think you have to almost have to be more aggressive than that now, because the benchmark is so short term. It's probably got a five or six year duration, and 70% US Treasuries. Uh, and uh, so it's probably a little more aggressive in. in uh, in your portfolio composition, I mean, I love the bond market, and I'm certainly not eliminating my position in the bond market. But uh, when you, if you look at these seemingly modest returns, 100% for stocks, possibly, 50% for bonds, that's three and a half percent. But those returns aren't bad, but they're not gross returns. So give your bond manager 100 basis points, and you're all of a sudden if you get to three and a half. All of a sudden you're at two and a half. And give your stock manager. Portfolio turnover, sales loads, uh, and then count inflation. Don't forget inflation. These are these are nominal returns, and they really don't look very good. Uh, and, but should you vary from them? Should you leave the market standard because you can't handle the low returns? I don't recommend that. Uh, it's you know you're bound by the market returns. Ultimately, all of us as investors are no secret about that. But think about inflation when you look at the, that chart. And then think about the fact those returns are before costs. Costs matter. Uh, yields are hard to come by today. So look at that next chart. Um, <coughs> there are the yields on our funds, and they're, they're kind of funny. I'm not sure exactly how we calculate them. But that, those, those are what you see if you go to our website. Uh, but we know that um, you know the yields in recent years uh, have ranged bond yields from four percent to seven percent, and now they're they're coming up with two to three percent last couple of years. So they're way below historical standards. But I, I still don't believe in reaching. But if you want to go toward the long and toward the corporate as compared to the governments, and municipal bonds are quite attractive on a tax-adjusted basis. 
and uh, it's, a, it's your own call. And I don't do it, but people ought to be aware that those yields are really pretty pathetic. Um, how much should be an international? Uh, I think there's my kind of closing comments here. Uh, I tried to say, and I did it practically this year, don't talk about international. Just look at the international, look at what you're buying. So if you want to put that next chart up, you can see that if you want 55% of your money in Japan, which is not doing so well, in Britain, which is austerity, is, is costing them a lot, in France, which still doesn't work, uh, that's 55% of your assets. Is that what you want? Do it, but don't put it under some uh, idea that you have to be an international. Uh, you have to be in those countries, is what you're really saying, is half of the developed market index. So think about that. When you get to the emerging markets, you know, good or bad, uh, realize that half of it is in China, Korea, and Brazil. As we all know, in recent years, the so-called BRICS, Brazil, China, India, and Russia, uh, have been very poor performers. Uh, inevitably, when the Dalby moves, they're not going to do well. So think about what you're buying when you buy international. No, I don't do international. Uh, I've told you my reasons before, and I, you know, I don't think it's going to matter much in the long run. And the record would show that there are short-term fluctuations, but not long-term. The main message I want to leave is think about what you're getting. Don't just say international is good. And the correlations, of course, when, with U.S. markets, when the market gets bad, uh, and are uh, uh, almost 100%, 100. Uh, with in, international diversification, as the wise man said, leads us Let's us down just when we need it first, and that's true. So finally, you have a bunch of posted uh, posts on the Vogelhead's uh, board, our target to change our target retirement funds. I just took this example for the 2025 to show you how much it's changed. First, to increase the equity ratio, probably back in 2004 or 5, significantly increase it um, from the 60% it was at our inception, and then today, 12% international for you. And then recently, uh, from, uh, 20, from 73% uh, with the additional international and the additional change back in 2004 and 73%, that's a big change. 70%, 73%, 22% international, 12 and uh, international change was made just recently. And uh, I don't, you know, I don't have any inside track, but I'd, I'd love to know the rationale for that. Yeah, there are people who are going to tell you, you tell us, as a matter of fact, yourselves. It looks like we just do things to be competitive. You also tell us that we couldn't have picked a worse time to add to international. It happens to be true. Uh, I showed you, we just left the darn thing alone. Uh, the cumulative return would have been 51%, uh, 51.5% 51 total return, and the fund actually delivered 37.9%. Now, is that a prediction that we did the wrong thing? Please, no. I have no idea whether they've done exactly the right thing or not, but I do think maybe it would be worthwhile uh, to have a little more explanation of why it gets done, because it's a very important part of it. All right, now I have, that's it for the charts and numbers. They're not there for themselves, all these numbers. Underline, to try and explain, underlie and explain the concept to underline my absolute conviction that mathematics and simplicity and economy and efficiency are the keys to successful investing for a lifetime. Ultimately, uh, alas, after I'm gone, those principles will in fact change the world of investing. And much more parenthetically, we'll finally get the institutional money managers, who I mentioned, control 70% of all stock, every public corporation in America, off their darn duffel bags, honor their fiduciary duty, and assume their full responsibility for corporate citizenship. That's not happening. And the index funds are at the bottom of the deck in terms of ours and others uh, are at the bottom of the deck in terms of activity and corporate governance. It's easy to measure. How do you vote on compensation plans? That's a leadership vacuum. But for the good of our country, I think, um, has to be filled. Uh, the obvious leader is the index fund should be, must be, because they buy and hold forever, and they can't follow the Wall Street rule, which is if you don't like the management, sell the stock. And Benjamin Graham in his initial books was very strong in recommending much more activism on the part of institutional investors, and what it was only a small portion of what it is now. 
and we, we should eschew that wisdom and, uh, and get back where we ought to be as corporate citizens. So here I stand uh, at age 82, I can't believe it, uh, just a few simple innovations to my credit, I guess, mutual structure, uh, the index fund, the defined maturity bond fund, uh, changes that as modest as they seem and as simple as they in fact are, are central to mission with a giant goal, my giant goal, to make the world a better place for the investors who are earnestly seeking to save for their financial futures. That's what's important about the financial system. Compared to Steve Jobs, I guess I ought to mention him, everybody else does, you know, uh, who simplified packaged and marketing, quote, insanely great, quote, products that changed all of our lives. My accomplishments, if I dare to even compare them, uh, are modest to a fault. But I am struck with both the unfairness of life that enabled me, thanks to the miracles of modern technology and care, to outlive a man who was born four years after I graduated from college. It's very, very sad. Nonetheless, as I read the stories about his amazing life, truly amazing life, I'm really struck by some of the similarities we share. Let me give you these couple. Comment by venture capitalists, Arthur Brock and Steve Jobs. He got ideas in his head, and the hell with what anybody else wanted to do. <laughs> Steve Jobs himself, getting fired, in his case from Apple, and in my case from Wellington, was the best thing that ever happened to me. Steve, again, I never asked customers what they wanted. If it's something truly revolutionary, they won't be able to help you. Simplify, simplify, sim simplify. And finally, great companies must have a noble cause. Then it's the leader's job to transfer that noble cause into an inspiring vision. I'm sure you see the parallels, even I acknowledge them in comparisons. Self-serving if there were one. But whatever the elusive truth would tell us, it's not yesterday's accomplishments that interest me. It's tomorrow's challenges in changing the way we think about investing, even as I wait patiently. Well, not really patiently, actually. <laughs> and I'll let the financial industry do a last get it. But I'll press on regardless remains my mind. So thank you for your patience. Sorry to run over. And uh, we'll take a little break to catch our breath, and then I'll try to answer your questions. Thank you all so much.